That is cruel. That is horrifying. That is great storytelling. <laughs> Kaz needs therapy. They all need therapy. But Kaz definitely needs therapy. Learn how to deal with your emotions, boy. And I love my two chaotic bi icons because that's what they now are to me. Hello, I'm Jessie the Sleepy Koala because I'm both Australian and perpetually tired. Today, I wanted to talk about the characters and relationships in Crooked Kingdom. Last time I spoke about Crooked Kingdom, I was a little bit grumpy and had a fair few negative comments to say, but this time it's mostly all positive. I think it's actually all positive uh, because Leah Bardugo is incredibly good with characters and she's incredibly good with relationships. So I don't know if I actually have anything negative to say this episode, but if I do, it'll be very minimal. So I will be happy octopus today. Like I mentioned, Leah Bardugo is very good with her character work. We saw this in Six of Crows. She spent quite a lot of the first two thirds of the Six of Crows books focusing on character development and character depth. So when we got to the end of it, even though it was heavily plot based, we already had that strong connection to the characters and that increased the adrenaline and the worry about watching them go through the ice court heist and whether they were going to do it, whether they were going to fail, what was going to go wrong, and how was it going to impact our characters. So uh, she did incredibly well in the first book. She also focused on backstories for Kaz and Nina and Matthias. I think that both of these were done very well, but I think Kaz's backstory in particular was done incredibly to really show his motivations and who he was and how he turned into who he is. She did very well in the first book. I think she delivers just as well in this book. She goes into the backstories of Jasper, Wyland, and you could argue Inej. I'm not sure if I would quite say that she goes into Inej's backstory, but she does do a lot with Inej's character. But first, I would like to talk about Jasper and Jasper as a character, Jesper with his relationships with people, just Jesper's backstory. I want to talk about it all because I think that Jesper's story was the most well done in this book. We get so much about his childhood. We learn about his mother. We learn about his father. We see his father, which is such an interesting change because not only do we have the background knowledge of who his father is and what he went through with the death of his wife and how he feels about Grisha, we now have to watch this all play out and kind of explode as he is pulled into the life of the crows and the life that Jasper now leads, which seems to be everything that he didn't want his son to be a part of. We also, of course, get the amazing and finally here relationship between Jasper and Wyland. I have been waiting for this since the first book. The flirtation has been on point for the entire time and I'm so glad that they finally got there and were able to acknowledge their feelings and were able to help each other in ways that I don't think the other crows could help. And we saw this in the first book, particularly with the, the scene where they're sabotaging the bridge. It was all there. The makings of it on top of all the flirtation finally paid off. It was worth it. The way Badugo built up that flirtation, that relationship to get to this point has been really well done. But to dig into these relationships a bit more. Firstly, let's start with Jasper and his dad. In this book, Jasper's dad turns up after he receives a note saying that the bank is moving up the payments on the farm. Jasper loaned out his father's farm to try and pay for his gambling debts. 
His father is not aware of this. His father thinks otherwise. So his father turns up in Ketadam based on a note that is very clearly fake and a ploy. But of course, Jesper's dad is not going to know this. He is a is a humble, nice, friendly man. He is not even going to imagine that there's going to be deception involved. And this is clear from the very beginning, as it's described in our first meeting of Colm Fahey in the book. All his attention focused on the man standing near the eastern wall, gazing up at the stained glass windows, a crumpled hat clasped in his hand. With a pang, Jesper realized his father had worn his best suit. He had combed his kalish red hair tidily back from his brow. There was grey in it now that hadn't been there when Jesper left home. Colm Fahey looked like a farmer on his way to church. Totally out of place. Kaz, hell, anyone in the barrel would take one look at him and just see a walking, talking target. He's the complete opposite of everything that we've seen of our characters in the barrel and particularly the complete opposite of Jesper because Jesper's so far in deep in what he's doing in the barrel compared to his father who lives a simple life and is not looking for issues to come his way, not looking for fights like Jesper does. And the inclusion of Colm Fahey in the narrative makes Jesper have to stop and think about what he's doing because now his father is in danger and later in the same chapter that I just read from, he acknowledges that and he acknowledges to himself that he didn't feel that rush of adrenaline that he normally gets in a fight because his dad could have died or his dad could have been hurt and that is terrifying to Jesper. So now we've actually got a reason that Jesper has to stop and think about what he's doing. Because up till now, he just does things and he doesn't seem to care about the consequences. And now he has to. Now the consequences actually have a lot more stakes than if it's just his life on the line. But despite all the differences between who they are and the fact that Colm does not want to incite trouble, he still ends up in the middle of their team and is an active player who is completely integral to what they're doing and to making sure that the auction goes as they plan. Without him, everything else crumbles, but he is also not the person who would ever want to get into something like that. But he does, and he does it for his son, because he wants to help his son, and his son is in such a bind that so he will do whatever he can. He also seems to accept, even if it is wearily and not because he really wants to, that Jesper is involved with bad things. Even before Jesper and Colm actually even attempt to talk about it. Colm has just accepted all of these crows into his hotel room to hide because they are now the most wanted people in all of Ketadam. And he just puts up with it. He just takes them in and he puts up with it. At one point, he starts cleaning up and Jasper says to him, you don't have to clean up after us. And from memory, his response is, somebody does, which is such a parent thing to say. But also, I think just shows the integrity that he has because he would do that for a bunch of strangers who he now knows are criminals and are in the middle of quite a lot of shit. But yet, he still does small things to help them. But when Jasper Jesper goes to talk to him, he chickens out, he can't do it, and I get it. That would be hard. I don't know if I would do any better in Jesper's situation, and I can very much sympathize with how hard it would be to try and have a conversation that not only explains your addiction, and also the fact that you're part of crime, and also the fact that you love being part of crime, and that you love pretty much everything that you're involved in with Ketadam, current circumstances withstanding. And of course, on the other side, you have Colm. He doesn't hate Grisha, 
but he does have some sort of negative feelings towards them because he's so scared for Jasper and so worried about him being found out and bad things happening to him or Jasper being taken away, particularly after the death of his wife and the fact that it happened by her using her powers. I think the enhancement of this worry is pretty fair, but at the same time, it does put a lot on Jasper, particularly because he was eight or something when his mother passed. It puts a lot on him hiding his Grisha powers and not being able to accept them to the point in the first book. I think it's done so well that we never find out that he has powers until, until the ice court and he never thinks about it in his POVs. And I talked about last episode and also in the Six of Crows episode about when authors have characters that have knowledge but the audience doesn't know what it is and even though there was such a long period of time before we learnt about Jasper being a fabricator it made so much sense that he never thought about it because he had pushed it so far away in his mind and put it in a box and locked it and thrown away the key. So of course he's never gonna think about it. So of course the audience is never gonna know about it until it's revealed. But the reason he does that is because of how his father acts and how his father acted when they were growing up. Even before his mother died, his father was still pretty anti-Grisha, anti-Grisha powers, even though his mother would teach him in secret about how to use his Grisha powers, which I thought was very cute. But this has affected Jasper for a long time, and that has also caused the rift between them. So on both sides, you have people who really need to address how they're feeling about the way that the other one acts and how that has affected them. Of course, on Jasper's side, he also, you know, needs to explain everything. He really does. But by the end of the book, they have at least reached enough of a mutual understanding that Jasper's grown up, that Holm has his life and it is not the same as Jasper's anymore and he can't protect Jasper. It's up to Jasper now to protect himself and to look after himself even though it might be hard for his father to watch him do that. But isn't that just one of the sadnesses of parenthood? Because children grow up and children move out and go away and suddenly you can't protect them anymore. And it feels like even though Jasper grew up and went away, Tom was still trying to protect him and if he had known what Jasper was doing, then things would have been very different. I think that he would have come to the city a lot sooner and there would have been quite the confrontation. So by the end of the book, they do sort things out but they don't completely resolve everything. That's not how relationships work, and I very much appreciate that Bardugo doesn't just solve the problem so it is perfectly fine and move on from there. There's still work to be done, but there's enough resolution for us as readers to know that even though there's more work, they have found a place where they are no longer at conflict and can move on to that reconciliation stage. Okay, moving on, because I talked about that for way too long. Next, we have Jesper and Wylan. I love everything that happened in this book, but most of it can be summed up in what I said before. I did want to touch on one particular scene though, and it's the one where Jesper finds Kiwi at the piano, and of course, Kiwi and Wylan are wearing the same face at that point. Jesper mistakes him for Wylan and starts coming on to him. Kiwi has a crush on Jasper, so is totally into this. And then they kiss and Jasper realizes that it's not Wyland and Wyland turns up at the door. This scene happens just after Jasper has been trying to talk to his dad. So he's in a bit of a state at that point and he acknowledges it in this chapter when he's thinking about kissing Kiwi. And I am fascinated by this chapter because it would have been a terrible way 
for Jasper to treat Wylan. I'm not sure if I could say the same for Huey in this situation because he's super into it and knows what's going on and just goes with it. But if Jasper had actually been approaching Wylan in this scene, he wouldn't have been trying to kiss him because he was focused on Wylan and that's what he wanted to do simply because he liked him. He'd be doing it because he wants a distraction. And that is a terrible way to start a relationship, question mark? I don't even know if it would have started a relationship. But also, it'd be a terrible first kiss as well because Jasper's heart is in the mode of I just had a fight with my father and I want a distraction and I can't go out gambling so I guess I'll go find someone to make out with instead. I kind of assume that Jasper has done this in the past from some of the comments that are in this book. So it reduces Wyland to just another pretty face, just another buddy, when Wyland means more to him and Wyland means a lot more to him and that could have doomed everything from the start. It shows the internal battle that Jasper is still going through, that he's been struggling with this entire book, the last book, everything since he got into gambling and found that he could hide from his issues by going to the gambling table, hitting up on people, shooting things. Kaz even lists out in the book the different ways that Jasper runs away from his problem. You think you're a gambler, but you're just a born loser. Fights, cards, boys, girls, you'll keep playing until you lose. So for once in your life, just walk away. There's so many ways that he tries to hide and run from emotion and from what he doesn't want to look at and acknowledge. This is known by the people around him. People just know that he does this. Pretty much why he does it as well. It's not like it's even a secret. It's just a well-known flaw. It's another example of how he sh could have screwed something up because he is trying to run away from his feelings and because he is trying to hide from them. It's such a good example of how your actions have consequences. And luckily, the consequences of this were not as bad as they could have been, I think. I think it would have been much bad if Wylan actually was in that room. And I think Wylan being upset because Jasper kissed Kiwi and couldn't tell them apart, I think that's pretty justified. But I think it's also pretty much in Wylan's nature that he got over that pretty quickly. And luckily, they were able to move forward but I do wonder if Wylan had actually been in that room and Jasper had kissed him out of a desperation to forget what else was going on in his life, how that would have gone and how that would affect their relationship. Final Jasper relationship and then I'll move on to, you know, other characters. But there's so much about Jasper in this book. This is Jasper's book. It's also Wylan's book. But Jasper's storyline not only matters in the present and the past, it's, it's such a through thread and it ties things together. So I think it's fair to talk about it for quite a long time. Paz and Jasper. I kind of wish we had a book of some sort from before Six of Crows so we could see more what Kaz's relationship with Jasper was like. Because it seems like he trusts him as much as Kaz could trust people at the time, but I wonder if they had a friendship of some sort, even though neither of them would call it that, but some sort of camaraderie. And then the Ice Court mission happened, and all of this happened, and they grew closer, and that is nice. But I do wonder, because Kaz does seem to know Jasper really well, and if Jasper was just another drag, and just another, just another crow that works under Kaz, e even if he is one of the main people that Kaz constantly chooses to work with, Kaz understands Jasper really, really well. And this might just be because Kaz seems to understand everyone really, really well. But it's pretty fascinating to see because that's not something that I would expect from people who are acquaintances or work buddies. That's definitely something that like a deep friendship has. But I'm very interested of what their relationship was like because then we get the full arc 
showing us how they get to the point that they are at the end of the book, where I would say even Kaz would consider them friend. He wouldn't say it, but he would consider Jasper a friend. But of course, you then have this hiccup that's put in in Six of Crows and revealed at the end of the book, where Jasper betrayed the team even though he didn't mean to, and it almost ended the job early and almost killed Inej. Kaz has been holding this grudge pretty much the whole time, and we see this throughout this book. We continue to see this underlying current of animosity, particularly from Kaz, which comes to a head in the bell tower where they physically fight. And it was very interesting that one of the characters was really concerned and wanted to stop them. And the rest of them basically went, well, Jasper doesn't have his guns out and Kaz isn't using his cane. They're not fighting to kill each other. They're fighting to let out whatever energy is between them that was caused by the ice court heist. And after that, their relationship pretty much repairs itself. And it very much reminds me of a volcano and how the pressure of the lava eventually leads to it exploding. And that's really what seems to happen in this scene, particularly because they have all just been put on notice that they are the most wanted people in Ketterdam. They don't know what to do and don't know how to get out of it. So everyone's just a bit stressed and Kaz is just quite stressed. And then this just comes on top of it and it's like, nah, we're going at it and we're going at it now. And it does seem to let off the steam that they need to let off. It does seem to start to repair whatever was wrong between them. And particularly with Kaz, he seems to let the grudge go, which is interesting because Kaz is not good at forgiveness. But also, I think Kaz's theme in this book is attempts at forgiveness. This kind of fits the bill pretty well. And during the fight, Kaz is brutal, not just physically, but, but verbally as well. He throws insults, he divulges what happened with the ice court mission just to try and hurt Jasper. But in the end, it's not even about Jasper. Kaz is struggling with the memory of his brother, but not the memory of a child looking up at his brother anymore, but as someone that is older, looking back on who Jordy was, and Kaz can now see the problems that were there. And part of him resents that, and he struggles with whether he forgive his brother for how he acted. And this comes out in the fight with Jesper, and it shows that the animosity towards Jesper, yeah, it was kind of there, but a lot of it was tied up with his thoughts and feelings about his brother. And I think that's why after this fight, the rift between Jasper and Kaz pretty much heals because it wasn't that big to begin with. Kaz just had to separate the way that he felt towards Jasper and the way he felt towards his brother. Even while there is this animosity throughout the book, Kaz has these moments of kindness towards Jasper in ways that show me that he still considers a Jasper a friend and Kaz is just hurt and feels betrayed over the ice court job. For example, when Combe is brought to the tomb and they're talking about the farm and how he might lose it, Kaz outright says, we're going to get your money, you won't lose your farm, which is not a Kaz thing to say. That is a moment of kindness that I would not expect to come from Kaz Brecker. And it's towards Jesper's father as well. And I think that speaks volumes because he doesn't know Jesper's father. He would see Jesper's father as a mark and probably nothing more, except he's Jesper's father. Kaz cares about Jesper. He doesn't always know how to show it, but he's getting better. Kaz in this book gets much better at trying to reach out to people and to show his emotion. And in this scene, there is another moment of kindness when Kaz pulls out Jasper's revolvers, which Jasper had bet earlier in the book to help a job go smoothly. And after that job, Jasper's talking about his revolvers and Kaz says something pretty snarky, trying to get the revolvers back to Jasper. But yet, he does it really quickly. There is not a lot of time 
between when Jesper loses his revolvers and they have that conversation and now, and yet Kaz got them back. He didn't need to because he's Kaz Brecker and he really could have drawn this out. And maybe you could argue that Jesper needs his guns to be the best gunslinger. And that's Kaz's explanation. But I think there is more there. I think he did it because he knows how much those guns mean to Jesper. He didn't want Jesper to be without them because they mean so much. At the boathouse, when Kaz tells them that they got the 30 million in the end, that they were meant to be paid for the ice court job and it was being split between them, there's this really nice and honestly, I would almost say sweet in a way exchange between Jesper and Kaz. Jesper braced himself and said, actually, you should put my share in my father's name. I don't think, I don't think I'm ready for that kind of money just yet. Kaz watched him for a long moment. That's the right move, Jez. Firstly, this is great character development for Jesper of learning to take responsibility and knowing where his triggers are and being able to separate himself from them so that he doesn't go back down the path that he's been down in the past and failed with. But secondly, the fact is that Kaz, who cares pretty much exclusively for money most of the time, and is fine fleecing people and stealing things, and also who encourages things such as gambling and drinking in the Crow Club and the Barrel, the fact that he turns to Jasper and tells him it's a good idea for him to put the money away where it is safe with someone else and to also pay off that debt with his father to help fix that part of their relationship. That's amazing. That really shows that Kaz cares and considers Jesper a friend, and he wants the best for Jesper. He's just not very good at telling Jesper that, or anyone for that matter, because he's Kaz Brecker and he's not good with emotion, but he does have these small moments of it. And there's another one right at the end. Kaz tilted his head, watching a girl arc above them, wings spread wide. Tell Jesper he's missed around the slat. Inej raised a brow. Around the slat. From Kaz, that was as good as a bouquet of flowers and a heartfelt hug, and it would mean the world to Jasper. And yeah, I think it would. Not only because it shows forgiveness, and I think Jasper sees that, but also shows the Kaz cares, and I think Jasper's always wanted to please Kaz and was never against friendship with him. It was just the walls that Kaz put up. And I think Jasper really likes the fact that he has a friend in Kaz, so I'm not at all surprised that that would mean a lot to Jasper. I can very much understand that. Next up to talk about, moving on from Jasper, is Inej, the wonderful, wonderful Inej, who had a much more subtle character arc, I think, in this book than some of the other characters. I didn't actually pick it up until my second reading, actually. At the same time, I think it's very important for where she gets to at the end with finally going off to hunt pirates on her new boat, The Wraith, which is just, that was such a good scene. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. I think Inez's storyline is about self-acceptance and particularly accepting what she has done while she is a criminal, because she has always kept this lightness about her, this niceness, this caring, and it's one of the things that makes her such a lovable character because she is also a lovable person who loves the people that are connected to her. But this book shows that she struggles with the idea of how she is not innocent. And I don't think it's her fault, after everything she went through, that she got to this point in her life. What she's done so far has just been to survive. Yes, that has involved stealing and murder and breaking and entering, and 
insert list of crimes. But this idea that she doesn't think she's innocent and doesn't know if she's worth redemption or forgiveness first comes up right at the beginning of the book when she's captured by Van Eek and is being tortured. I'm going to excavate that pathetic excuse of a heart from your chest. It was an evil thought, a vile thought, but she couldn't help it. Would her saints sanction such a thing? Could forgiveness come if she killed not to survive, but because she burned with living, luminous hatred? I don't care, she thought as her body spasmed and the guards lifted her trembling form from the table. I'll do penance for the rest of my days if it means I get to kill him. I think this really shows that any murders that Inej has done previously have really fallen under that need to survive. And it's said at some point in the book that she cried over the first person that she had to kill. And it wasn't done out of malice. It wasn't done out of her anger or hatred. It was done because it was necessary. And tied into all of this is the fact that she sees herself connected to Kaz. And she's not the only one. That's how Van Eeg tries to torture her, trying to break her legs. And the only way that she's able to stop him is by telling him, he'll never trade if you break me. And she believes that because she's so connected to Kaz through the fact that he has her indenture, through the fact that she works for him and works very closely with him. And of course, there is the whole relationship side, but I'll get to that a little bit later because there's a lot of character stuff to go through first. But this book, she works on not only figuring out how to be her own person and how to not have to have this strong tie to Kaz that prevents her from doing what she wants, but also she has to learn how to forgive herself or to accept herself. And she does this and I loved it so much. It's right at the end of the book where she She's fighting Dunyasha, who I still think is a dumb character. But Dunyasha hits the exact same chord that Inej thinks about at, back at the beginning when she wants to hurt Vani. You know it's only a matter of time before this ends and justice is done. Justice? You are a murderer and a thief. I was chosen to rid this world of people like you. A criminal may pay my wages, but I have never taken an innocent life. That word sounded a discordant note inside Enej. Was she innocent? She regretted the lives she had taken, but she would take them again to save her own life, the lives of her friends. She had stolen. She had helped Kaz blackmail good men and bad. Could she say the choices she had made were the only choices put to her? But she accepts that. She accepts herself and she accepts what she's done. She accepts that she would prefer to have gone the life of being a killer than being a slave. And that when she met her saints, she would do it with a ready spirit and hope that they would accept her. That is a big change from the woman that we met at the beginning of the book, who not only found herself pained to a man she cared about, but still chained, and also she didn't know how to accept what she'd done or herself. But yeah, but yeah, she gets to that point, that tipping point during the fight where she does accept it, and she does accept who she is, and what she is capable of. And she finds her peace in doing so. And I think if this hadn't happened, then the end of the book where she does get her ship and she is gonna go and leave and be on her ship and fight pirates, which is awesome. Very, very awesome. I think it would have felt like there was something small missing from the moment. And it's that acceptance that Inej is happy to step away and be who she is and be happy with who she is. And that was such a powerful character arc to see. It was so subtle. Again, I didn't pick up on it my first read. I picked up on it my second read. And I'm so glad that I did. Because suddenly the building blocks of Inesha's story came together like puzzle pieces. And it was perfect. I'm going to talk about Kaz before I talk about the relationship between Inej and Kaz. Because that seems like the most straightforward way to do it. Kaz. Oh my gosh, Kaz. He is such an interesting look at a gray morality character because he really fits the bill. In a different story, 
Kaz is the villain. Straight up. That is not hard to see. And I think it's only stories like these ones where we are from the crow's perspective and watching them do things. At least in these cases, they are going against other bad people who you don't like and you want to see taken down. This is the circumstance of Kaz being the good guy and the good character. If anything, I would say he is much closer to the to the antagonist evil side than like Smash bang gray morality, but it's also hard for me not to see him with that gray morality perspective because he is neither 100% good or 100% bad. And all of the crows are like this. They all do terrible things, but at the same time, they are the good guys in the story. But I think Kaz is just the strongest character like this out of all of them. And I think he goes out of his way sometimes to make himself worse than he actually is. I do think he is the type of person to do a lot of crime and hurt people and do really bad things and he doesn't feel bad about it. I do think he has that aspect of his character, but in certain circumstances, he goes even further. Further. And this is really apparent with everything with his brother, with Jordy, and how he has treated that situation. But even when he's talking about these things, he does it in such a cruel way that he doesn't have to. And a lot of it, I think, comes from anger. And where that anger is meant to be pointed is a question to be considered, because I don't think it's just pointing at one place. I do think largely it is pointed smack bang pecker roller. That is not hard to guess. That is not hard to see. Kaz hates him with a vengeance. But I do think part of the anger is towards his brother. And what I was talking about earlier with Jesper and how Kaz calls Jesper his brother's name, it shows that he is struggling with the idea of did Geordie betray him in the way he acted. I think there's anger there, and I think some of the anger that fuels his need for retribution is towards his brother, but then I think there's also anger towards himself, because he wasn't able to do anything, because he was the brother to survive, and maybe he doesn't think that he deserved to, and doesn't know how to admit it, and doesn't know how to see that he has anger towards himself as well as to other people. But I think this makes him ruler than in situations where none of the stuff with Jordy is front of the mind and relevant at the time. And I think in those places, a cool, calm-headed barrel bus who can easily send someone out, who can easily send a Nej out to stab someone if he wants, or to have other drags go and beat someone up. And I don't think he feels remorse for that. But I do think in terms of his brother, a lot of that calmness goes out the window and he and he gives into emotions so much more. And I think he also uses this as a shield and he does that against Inej when they are in the bathroom together. His PTSD is triggered and his way of putting up a wall is to not just get angry, but to get cruel and to try and send her away and make her hate him. And he does that by talking about what happened with his brother, but specifically what he did to the people involved and how they suffered. Because maybe if Inej can learn to hate him enough because of those things, then he doesn't have to try and deal with the emotions that roll around his head that he is not good with dealing with because he never deals with his emotions ever. Kaz needs therapy. They all need therapy. But Kaz definitely needs therapy. Learn how to deal with your emotions, boy. Even though he acts more cruel, what is interesting though is the final showdown with Pekka Rollins is actually pretty calm on Kaz's part. He has come up with what is a terrifying and horrifying plan that is also pretty brilliant and is definitely not one that I was expecting. I thought he was just going to kill the guy, but I can see why he wanted to inflict Roland with what Kaz had to deal with. And that is such a cruel punishment, but Kaz in that scene is so level-headed, but his hatred is still there and you can see it 
in the lines where he's telling Pekka Rollins to say his brother's name. And if he says Geordi's name, if he remembers it, then Kaz will let his son live. That is cruel. That is horrifying. That is great storytelling. <laughs> but in the end, Kaz does show mercy. And I think it shows that he is not as cruel as he tries to make himself appear. He doesn't actually bury the child and the mind games, still pretty horrifying, but the idea of burying a child is much harder to swallow when you still want to like the guy in the end. So, so I was, and if he had actually gone through with burying Van Eek's child, then that really pushes him from grey morality just straight into villain territory. That is a pretty unforgivable act, but I think the fact that he didn't shows that he is not the person that he always tries to show that he is. He has the ability to show mercy. And I think it also shows that he doesn't want to harm children. And that comes up at the beginning of the book as well, when they're breaking into the lawyer's house and the little girl appears. He scares the bejeebas out of her and makes it so that she will probably have nightmares for a very long time, but he could have killed her and he didn't. And I think between these two scenes, it does show that he won't hurt children despite everything else he will do. As Inej points out at the end, he won't own people either, and that is the reason that she thinks that he is different to the other barrel bosses. It's these small moments of mercy and also the moments of kindness that I pointed out with Jasper that I think really play into Kaz being morally grey instead of just a morally black character. He does have the capacity to care. He does have the capacity to do the good thing, the right thing. He does have limits on what he will do. Kaz Brecker is probably the most fascinating character in this duology, and at this point I have also finished the King of Scars duology, and I still think he's probably the most fascinating character that I have read in Bardugo's works so far. We will see going forward, maybe that will change, but there's just so much to him. There's so much depth, there's so many layers, and I'm also a sucker for a guy with a tragic backstory, so there's also that one. Hello, this is Jesse from the future. I recorded for so long the other day that my husband came home and had to start work, so I'm having to finish this video on another day, which, considering this is already two videos, I have probably gone a bit overboard on this review, which my husband says I should now call a literary analysis, which you know is probably a good idea at this point. The final relationship to talk about is, of course, Kaz and Inej, and I've touched on a little bit of their relationship, talking about them individually, but I just find their dynamic so fascinating and how it changes over this book compared to the last book, and also just where it ends up. What I really like that Bardugo has done is that she has taken a relationship that is not healthy. It's clear that they have feelings for each other, but they don't know how to express those in a healthy way or how to proceed in a healthy way. And this isn't fixed by the end of the book. She doesn't make it all go away, she doesn't have the happily ever after. And a lot of the time in media, like I'm so used to seeing the main male and female lead, regardless of whatever problems they have, they get together in the end and ride off into the sunset. And Badugo doesn't do that, though Inej probably sails off into the sunset, but she does it by herself, she needs that independence. I thought this book was a great exploration for both characters, of finding where their limits are and knowing where they need to stop and how they are able to exist without having this strong connection tether that has come from the fact that Kaz saved Inej from the menagerie. 
She has been a indenture of the dregs ever since. He is in a role of power over her and always has been. And the way that he acts towards her when he wants to push her away just tries to enforce that further and he tries to use his standing to widen that gap between them to not accept that she is happy to be close to him because he is afraid of someone being close. But yet, Kaz still feels like he needs her. He tries to hide this behind the fact that she's the wraith, she's his spider, he needs her to do jobs, but there's more to it than that. And we learn that through things like how Inez used to sit and feed the birds on his windowsill while he worked in his office. That's not something Kaz would let literally anybody else do. Yet he has these fond memories of Inej doing it. He clearly cares about her. He just really has no idea how her emotions work or how to even express to himself those emotions because he is so terrified, I think, of losing her and of having someone that he cares about again after Geordie and having them disappear whether it be through death, through leaving, through something else. I think that's why he pulls himself away so much from Inej. But yet, he still feels for her. And I think this comes through in those small moments where he would allow her to do something or would do something for her that he wouldn't do for anyone else. But like I said, when talking just about Kaz, I think he is falling more and more into having these moments of kindness and empathy. And we see that with Jesper as well. And this book really shows that change that is beginning. By the end, he is not there. He is by no way cured of his problem. No one is going to look at Kaz Brecker at the end of the book and go, you're a stand-up guy who's nice to everyone and completely understands how to have a conversation about how you feel about people. He's getting there, but he's not there yet. And I think this change in Kaz is also what allows him to start letting Inej go. It's the whole cliche of, if they truly love you, they'll come back to you type thing. And I think that's where this is going. Like, Inej needs to leave. That is what she needs. And Kaz finally gets to a point where he accepts that and accepts that her leaving doesn't mean she's gone. And that's a very big distinction that I think really would have struggled with for a very long time in the past. And we see this play out when he gives her her indenture paperwork and the meaning that comes with that and behind that, not only of you are no longer an indenture, you now own yourself. And that is a big thing after everything that Inej has went through and the fact that she did not sell herself into slavery, she was taken and trapped in slavery. But there's also the double meaning of Kaz saying he's okay with her stepping away. That is very much how I read that scene. And Kaz does not know how to use words, so he tries to do it through actions. And I think that's what this action was meant to really show. And this was this was accumulation of those small acceptances that Kaz had been working on since the last book, where he asks her to stay and she says, no, I'm not going to stay if you're going to keep up your walls. And he's been working on them. This is his acknowledgement that he accepts that she's going to leave, that he accepts he is not at the point yet to have his walls down for her, but that he's also working on it. And I thought that was a very, very powerful moment. Now that I have continued to talk about Kaz Brecker for even longer. Let's flip back to Inej. As I mentioned earlier, she has this storyline of accepting herself and accepting what she's done. And I think it's also the story of her accepting that she can't be chained to Kaz in the way that she has been and that she needs independence and she needs to be who she wants to be without any of the chains that have bound her. And to do that, she does need to step away, both physically because she's getting on a boat and leaving, but also I think mentally needs to step away from Kaz so she can work 
on her own issues. The fact that we go from Inej at the beginning of the book believing that she's only worth so much to Kaz if she can perform her as his spider, as his underling, where he has the power in this relationship. And she truly believes that he won't come for her. She wants him to, but it's not the right play, as she thinks to herself, so she doesn't think it will happen even though she really wishes and hopes that he does. She goes from that to being an independent, confident woman who is ready to go battle pirates and doesn't have things holding her back. And that is such a great metamorphosis to see of Inej. And I think the scene in the bathroom, that scene, probably the crowning scene in this book for the Kaz and Inej relationship, And I was on the edge of my seat reading this chapter. I could not believe we were getting something like this, and I was here for it. It was really good. I love the dynamics in this scene. I love that they actually have a conversation where they talk about their (laughs) feelings-ish, ish, in their own way. In their own way, they convey their feelings, and they convey their trauma. Neither of them want to let it go and not pursue this. They want to try. They're just bad at it. (laughs) They're very bad at it. But this scene is such, it's a small step, but it's a step. Kaz pushing his own PTSD boundaries to try and get closer in at least one way that he doesn't know how to, but can try with was incredible to see and of course it goes wrong and it all backfires and he turns into a very mean person again to try and push her away but it's a one step forward two step back type thing it he still tried and is openly disdainful of some of the kindnesses that she does for other people She still feels like she can open up enough about her vulnerabilities and trauma to try and show that she is willing to take a step forward as well so that he knows he can. God, they try, and that means so much, I think, but it does fail. And that's actually really good storytelling, I think, because that is very realistic. It would be so hard in a situation like this where you both have such deep-seated trauma that neither of you have worked through, but they're getting that. They're getting through working through it very slowly to try and turn that into a relationship that isn't just a toxic mess. If they had gotten together at this point or at the end of this book, it would have just devolved into an awful relationship because neither of them have worked on their own issues enough to not make it the other person's issue as well. And it's one thing to support a partner who is dealing with issues or dealing with trauma, it's another thing to carry that for them. And I feel like that's kind of where it would end up if they had gone together at the end. But speaking of the end of the book, Kaz buys her a boat, just what every girl wants. No, but that is what Inej wants. And he's trying to show that he does care. And again, like with the indenture paperwork, to me, this signals that he is trying to say that he's accepting that she will leave and physically gives her the means to leave again. He has accepted that she won't be there. But again, her leaving doesn't mean she's gone. And I think that's really where Kaz has gotten to by the end of this book. And while she is away, he will continue to try and work on his PTSD, is what I really hope. And Inej, just by going and doing what she wants to do, and finally having control of her own life, that in in and of itself is probably going to be a really good healing factor for her, because she now has that control back in her own hands and she can do what she wants. She can go fight pirates. She can go where she wants. She doesn't have to be under anyone else's power or control. And this means going forward, 
that power dynamic isn't going to be there. Or if it is there, it's going to be a holdover from how they interacted before and very well could just disappear entirely because he's still the gang leader, but she's not the slave. And with any budding relationship, even with him being the gang leader, if she's a member of the dregs, I I don't think that there's going to be that power dynamic anymore if they continue to pursue this relationship, because having that power dynamic would be harmful. The other thing that I really love about their relationship that is completely fascinating is so much of it comes from subtlety and subtext instead of very in-your-face, obvious, I love you, hurrah, heroics, that a lot of the other male-female lead couples in books, in TV shows and movies, that's generally how it comes across. And I really appreciate this because I don't know if I have seen it in another heterosexual couple in a book before, but I have seen it in a lot of media where people headcanon characters as queer. And it comes from the ambiguity that is baked in about the characters in general and their general interactions with other people, which can have a lot of really subtle interactions that can be read in a way that is romantic. And I think Bardugo uses that technique deliberately in this book. Kaz and Inej, they can't express their emotions for each other because, as we've established, no one is good at talking about their feelings in this book, but they also can't touch and taking these two things away doesn't leave a lot of very overt signs of interest, of romantic inclination, of love, and having it all be subtle and things like a quick glance, a worried thought, a vague conversation that can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. This is really good character relationship development, I would say, because it shows me the interest, whereas a lot of other types of media, it feels like I'm more being told that these two characters are going to get together, or, hey, they're the male and female lead, of course they will get together. Whereas this, it's all in the motions, it's all in the actions, and we're not told that they're interested in each other, we are shown from their perspectives of how they think of each other, how they interact together, the small movements and moments that they notice of each other that give that feeling of, oh, Kaz likes Inej, Inej likes Kaz, where is this going? And it's been there since the start of Six of Crows, and it just continues throughout this as well. And I think it was really well done. Like, really, really well done. On top of buying her a boat, Kaz finds her parents. And that was such a sweet ending. And nothing at I was blown out of the water. The fact that Kaz Brecker would do something like that. But at the same time, I'm not surprised because he does care about her and he knows how much this would mean to her as well. And the dialogue at the end of her going to take him and he's wondering about his tie. I don't even know if he was trying to be funny in that scene or was legitimately asking because it was so wholesome. And Nezh introduces her eventual boyfriend to her parents, presumably. I would love to see that interaction. That would have been very, very amusing. It was such a happy scene to end on for not only a fairly dark duology, but with two characters that have been in the dark and haven't had that much happiness in their lives, or at least like the last however many years, for it to end on something that brings joy to a Nej and a Kaz. You can see it in his reaction to how she's reacting. 
That was a wonderful ending. Final note to end on, straight up, I am so over the goddamn moon happy that Nina and Jasper are confirmed canonically bisexual in this book. I love this so much. We have both a male and a female character who are both bisexual, instead of it just being a female character, which is the most common way it is done, because apparently gayness is much more palatable when you can sexualize it in the way that queer women have been sexualized for straight audiences, and particularly straight male audiences. So, also having the bisexual male as well, I think really helps to balance this out and show that both genders can be bisexual and we can put that in media and they can both be prominent and that is fine. And the other thing that I love about this is we have a homosexual relationship and a heterosexual relationship, which is also really great balancing because what happens a lot is there is a lot of biphobia that goes around from both the straight and the gay side where if someone is in a gay relationship, then, oh, you're obviously gay because you're dating someone who's the same gender as you, so you can't be bi because you're dating someone who's the same gender as you, obviously. And then, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, it's, well, of course you're straight, you're dating someone who's the opposite gender. What do you mean you're bisexual? If you were bisexual, then why are you in a heterosexual relationship? You just can't win. And this infuriates me to no extreme. I am very glad that Bardugo has included both a heterosexual relationship with Nina and Matthias and a gay relationship with Jesper and Wylan. And I think by having Nina in the heterosexual relationship, this does also try and help the fetishization of gay women who are so often put into the spotlight so that they can be sexualized by straight men and lose their agency and lose their sexuality in a way because they don't matter anymore. It's only how sexy they are to the straight audience. So having Nina be in the straight relationship, but also be bisexual shows that, yes, you can be bisexual and be in a straight relationship with Jesper. Yes, you can be bisexual and be in a gay relationship. And also these relationships They're not there to be fetishized and sexualized by the audience. They are there as relationships that may include sexualization on the author's part, but not just looking at a character and going, wow, gay girls are hot, so I'm gonna feel creepy towards you. I don't know. There's a lot of this stuff that goes around and it's really uncomfortable to deal with. So I wanted to say that I am very, very pleased by this, and I love my two chaotic bi icons, because that's what they now are to me. Thank you for watching, that went on for a very long time. If you have made it through this entire video, or the last one and this one, kudos to you, Uh, you deserve an award, this is very long, and I appreciate you listening to me blab for a very long time. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you probably with a shorter video next time. Bye!